today begins the last quarter of 2024. It doesn't really seem possible that the year has gone by uh, as quickly as it has, but we find ourselves in October. This quarter, we're going to focus attention a little bit on prayer, renewing our prayer life. We've talked about joy, and we've talked about transformation, and we've talked about faith, and we're going to talk now about prayer for this quarter. Not all our lessons will be on prayer, but we're going to have some, uh, we're going to revisit the concept and the subject of prayer. I think prayer is a very misunderstood subject. I think it's something that we need to take time to take a look at. This morning, I want to share a lesson with you entitled, Renewing Our Understanding of Prayer. If you notice from our reading in Luke chapter 11 and verse 1, the apostles watched Jesus pray. And then they said, teach us to pray. You know, prayer in its simplicity is communication with God. That is the privilege of the saved. You know, God communicates with us through His creation. We know that there is a Creator. And then, through His Word, we know our Creator's character. We know what He is we know uh, his, his character. We know what he wants and expects and demands from us. He communicates with us. And he allows us to communicate with him. As James was talking a minute ago during our Lord's Supper, Jesus died for us in our flaws and, and with our weaknesses. He died for us. And he lets us talk to him. And he listens to us if we are his children. But more than anything else, prayer is worship. Whether we do it in a corporate setting or whether we do it individually, we are worshiping the God of heaven by acknowledging his sovereignty by acknowledging that He is the Creator and we the creation. When we bow before the God of heaven, we are remembering who we are. We're remembering who God is. There's five avenues of worship given in Scripture. And notice that this is the one that the disciples ask for help with. You ever struggled in your prayer life? Has it ever been weak? Have you ever found that you're not spending the proper amount of time talking to God? Have you noticed in your life that maybe you get too busy to pray? Or maybe you find yourself at the end of the day and you realize, I haven't talked to God today. Or maybe you're carrying burdens that just seem too heavy for you. And yet, I haven't offered those to God. If the disciples who walked with Jesus every day had to ask for help in prayer, then you and I shouldn't feel bad about needing a little help in prayer. Needing to revisit Prayer. So this morning, I want us to look at what the Scripture teaches on a very, very basic level. And we'll add to the things that we talk about as we go through the next uh, weeks. What does the Scripture teach us about prayer? First of all, let me share this with you. Very simply, Jesus prayed. You know, we were talking uh, not long ago, we were talking in a group of people, and, and one of the questions that came up was, 
Why did Jesus pray? If Jesus is God, if Jesus is deity, even while on earth in human form, then why, if his, in his omniscience and in his power, why did Jesus need to pray? I think we need to look at it from the other side. If Jesus needed to pray, I need to pray. Prayer is something special. Prayer is something that we need to pay attention to. Uh, Matthew, Luke, John, they tell us that Jesus prayed. Not only did he pray, but he prayed often. Often he went off by himself to pray. Sometimes he prayed with his disciples. Jesus prayed alone. He prayed with others. He gave thanks. He petitioned God for help. When he needed he asked. Why would Jesus pray? First of all, in obedience to God. When he took on human form, Philippians chapter 2, he humbled himself to the point of obedience. He obeyed that which God had commanded. He submitted to God's will, John chapter 5 and verse 30. We know from the Garden of Gethsemane that Jesus prayed for strength. He prayed when he was afraid. He prayed when he didn't know what exactly was in front of him. He spoke to God on such a fervent level. He prayed as an example to us, 1 Peter 2 verse 21. And here in Luke chapter 11, we see that Jesus prayed in order that he might teach us to pray also. You know, if Jesus prayed, shouldn't it be apparent to us that prayer is important? There's something special about prayer. The scriptures teach us that we ought to always pray and never lose heart. It doesn't say to say prayers. It says to pray, to open our heart to God. The disciples saw Jesus pray and he asked, they asked him to teach them. There's something special about prayer. But it's confusing. Prayer is what I would call a, a, a paradox. The word paradox means that uh, you have a situation that seems to be contradictory. On its surface, it seems contradictory. Prayer seems that way. When you read about it in Scripture, it seems sometimes to, 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 to be contradictory in its character. It's simple, yet it's complex. It's easy, yet it's hard. It's convenient, yet often neglected. It frees us, yet we are constrained by the way that God has told us how to do it. It's something that we completely understand, yet we don't. And here's one. It's something we completely believe in, yet often we don't. For example... 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 17 says, Pray without ceasing. That's a tough concept for us, even though it's fairly simple. But he says, Pray without ceasing, yet in Matthew 6 and verse 7, we are told not to use vain repetition. Luke 18 and verse 1. Jesus said, uh, he, he taught a parable to teach that men ought to, always, or to, ought to pray and not lose heart. That men always ought to pray and not lose heart. But we don't know how. Romans chapter 8 and verse 26 tells us that the Holy Spirit needs to help us. Because we don't always know what to pray for as we ought. 
Matthew 6 and verse 9 tells us that God already knows what we need before we ask Him. Well, now we're getting confusing. Pray without ceasing, but yet God already knows what I need. I need to always pray and never lose heart, yet God already knows. So sometimes the concept of prayer is hard for our rational minds to comprehend. So in our minds, we got to fix it, right? If something seems contradictory to us, we got to fix it. So here's what we'll do. We'll oversimplify prayer, and we will uh, dumb it down to a concept that we can explain. And often when we do that, we trivialize the communication that God allows us to have with Him and the power of it. But then by the same token, sometimes we overcomplicate it. I was fairly young. I had someone to take me by the arm, pull me aside, and say, when you pray, you need to use the words that God used in His Word when you pray. What are you talking about? Well, you got to use thee and thou and... And this was an older gentleman, so I didn't want to... I didn't want to be disrespectful, but I, not even Jesus talked that way. King James talked that way during his time. There's nothing in the scriptures that teach us what types of words that we ought to use. So we will add to the word of God sometimes because we have to make prayer something that is is holy enough in our minds. We add to the posture. We add to the language. But God doesn't do that. We see in Scripture there's all kinds of postures of those who are offering prayer unto God. And the language was the language they spoke not the language of someone else. Prayer has, it's kind of a paradox when we look at it, but we have to understand that if Scripture seems contradictory, there's a problem with the way we're reading it, not with the way it's written. Scripture doesn't contradict itself. It complements itself. It adds to itself. So the paradox is not with prayer, but with our perception of it. We need to change our minds. We need to step back and see the difference and how we need to look at things differently. Prayer at its essence is worship. Think about this. If God commands us to pray, but then He has to help us do it, the Holy Spirit has to interpret those prayers and, and stand uh, uh, before the Lord on our behalf. If we're commanded to pray, but we have to have help doing it, understand this. Prayer is worship, and worship in all of its forms is offered to God, but it benefits us. You don't get down on your knees at night and inform God of things that have happened today. You don't ask God for something that He doesn't already know you and I need. Our prayers are not offered to God because God needs those they are offered to God because God will accept them as worship on our behalf and the benefit is ours. I think that simple concept, if we understand, it makes things open up so much more. Prayer is a privilege of Christians. It allows us to give thanks to our Father. 1 Thessalonians 5 verse 18. 
It allows us to make requests and to unburden our hearts and minds. Philippians 4, verse 6. It allows us to remember the welfare of others. 1 Thessalonians 5, 25, Hebrews 13, 18. Have a simple plea. Brethren, pray for us. And then it also allows us to confess our sins to God. 1 John 1 verse 9. We're able to confess what's on our hearts and unburden ourselves from sin. Prayer is not providing information to God. It is acknowledging Him as God. God spoke into existence Everything that exists today. He spoke. And that which was nothing was now something. Where there was nothing, everything came. It is that God who allows me to bow before Him and He will listen to me and allow me to give my burdens to Him. That should be overwhelming to us. How many times in our lives has someone taken a burden from us and we just felt the gratitude that, that uh, just, it was just overwhelming? The fact that someone had offered us that kind of help and allowed us to feel better and allowed us to, to take away that weight. That's what God allows us to do through prayer. Turn over with me. I want to share one verse with you that we all need to look at, and it's found in the book of James. James chapter 5, in verse 16. Speaking in that passage of prayer, notice what he says in verse 16. He says, confess your trespasses to one another and pray for one another that you may be healed. But look at the last part of that verse. The Holy Spirit through the pen of James tells us this, the effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man Avails much. Avails much. You know what those two words mean? You know how we would say it? They do a lot of good. The effective, fervent prayer of a righteous man does a lot of good. Again, not for God, but for us. And notice this. It doesn't say which effective, fervent prayer. It says the effective, fervent prayer. Every time we open our hearts to God in the manner in which He has appointed us to do, we benefit we receive those blessings. Prayer helps the one who offers the prayer. It's a sweet aroma before God because it is obedience to a command and it's also showing love for God in that we are bowing before Him. So it pleases God, but it benefits us. We should be thankful for the very avenue of prayer. We should be grateful to the God of heaven that he will open his ears to us. That he looks upon us with our faults, with our weaknesses, with love and allows us to talk to him. I want to share with you one more thing and that is this. That prayer is a privilege afforded to God's children. It is a privilege afforded to God's children. You ever thought about the question, who can pray? 
If we loosely define prayer as talking to God, then it appears that anybody could pray. And in a technical sense, that can be true. But notice this. I want to share with you two truths that are found in Scripture. Number one, anyone can pray. Number two, only the saved can pray. You say, well, whoa, 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 wait a minute. Wait a minute. Those are contradictory statements. How can both be biblical truths? Well, here's how it works. Anyone can attempt to talk to God. Anyone can attempt to talk to God. I've told you this before, but I don't believe. <laughs> you know what an atheist is? An atheist is somebody who generally doesn't believe in God, right? That's how we define it. I don't believe in atheists. I don't believe there's any such thing as an atheist. Now, you can turn your back on God if you want to, but you know he's there. You can run from him as hard as you want, but you know he's there. And I'm going to tell you this, you get in a spot deep enough, you're going to talk to him. It's not about who can utter words intended for the ears of God. It's about how does God receive those words. And for that, we must go back into the Scriptures. There's three ways that God receives prayer. Number one, He hears His children. Isn't it wonderful that God hears His children? His ears are open to, his, to their prayers. Second of all, He acknowledges those who are sincerely seeking Him. And we see that in Acts chapter 9, Acts chapter 10. And third of all, the prayers of those who refuse to obey Him are an abomination to God. God hears the prayers of His children. In John chapter 9 and verse 31, there was a simple blind man who received his sight. And the Pharisees couldn't stand that. They questioned him. They questioned his mama and daddy. And when they couldn't get satisfaction, they questioned him again. And the blind man said in John chapter 9 and verse 31, he said this. He said, we know. God doesn't hear the prayers of sinners, but we know that if anyone is a worshiper of God and does his will, he hears him. Think about that. Here's a man who is still under the old law, and he uses these words. We know that God doesn't hear those who won't hear him, but we also know that he hears those who will worship him and listen to him. 1 John 5 verse 14, if we ask anything according to his will, he hears us. 1 Peter chapter 3 and verse 12, For the eyes of the Lord are on the righteous, and His ears are open to their prayers. You know who the righteous are? Those who are living and practicing according to the Word of God. It's not somebody who has a halo or walks about a foot up off the ground. There's nobody like that. Those who are righteous are those who acknowledge the Word of God and attempt to live in accordance with His will. God hears the prayers of those who are obedient to Him and promises to always do so. Second of all, though, if you're sincerely seeking the Lord and you're calling to Him, I think the Scripture teaches us that He will acknowledge those prayers. We look in the book of Acts chapter 9 and we see Saul of Tarsus who came into contact with Jesus on the road to Damascus. And God, or yeah, God spoke to Ananias and said, go find Saul. What was he doing? Go find Saul, for he is praying. Saul was a, 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 a man of conviction and he was praying. 
in his blinded state, having met Jesus on the road, he was praying. And in answer to his prayer, God sent Ananias. God didn't save Saul because he was praying. God sent Ananias to teach him the gospel. You turn over one chapter and you find a man by the name of Cornelius. This was a devout man. Ladies and gentlemen, when you lived your life, you need to be spoken of as Cornelius was spoken of. Someone who was devout, someone who gave as he should, someone who prayed as he should, but he didn't know. He was a Gentile and he didn't know the gospel. And in answer to his prayer, God sent him Peter. And Peter spoke the word of the Lord. If we're sincerely seeking the Lord, and by the way, the Lord knows the difference. But if we're sincerely seeking the Lord, I believe from Scripture that the Lord will acknowledge our prayer. He won't save us in our sins, but I believe he will, make it right, he will make it such that we can learn the gospel. Whether it's from that Bible laying on our coffee table or whether it's someone coming and sharing the gospel with us. God acknowledges those who sincerely seek him. You'll never fool God. You'll never mock him. But those who are sincerely seeking, God acknowledges that. But then there's another group of people. Those who have no intention of following the Lord. Those who refuse to hear the Lord and then try to speak to Him. It is an abomination to God. Proverbs 28 and verse 9. One who turns away his ear from hearing the law, even his prayer is an abomination. Can you imagine God's creation trying to speak to him and it not being pleasing, but being disgusting to the Lord. Being something that is abominable. If you'll read the book of Proverbs chapter 1, beginning in verse 20 through the end of the chapter, there's some of the plainest language there you're going to find anywhere in Scripture about how God feels about those who will not listen to him. God said, I tried to teach you and you wouldn't listen. And when your calamity falls upon you, I will laugh. You say, wait, wait a minute, that doesn't sound like God at all. That's God. If we will not heed His word, He won't heed our word. But if we're sincerely seeking, if we are His children, He will acknowledge us. God is not mocked. He requires us to hear Him if we want to be heard. And I invite you to, to, over the next few weeks, take up the Word of God and look into prayer. It's all over the Scriptures. What does God say about prayer? By the way, read it all. When, when you just get a little bit and you stop, you don't have the whole story. And that's what's dangerous for us sometimes. Prayer is a subject that needs to be taught. It's a subject that needs to be revisited. It's a subject that needs to be renewed. You and I need to talk to God either more or better. We can always improve in everything that we do. Out of all the avenues of worship, this is the one the disciples asked for help with. So let it be a comfort to us today that if we sometimes struggle in this area, so did they. So did they. We've looked at a little information this morning very simple, very basic, and we're going to hopefully, Lord willing, add to that as we go along. But I want to ask you this morning by way of invitation, very simply, does God hear your prayers? 
Can you pray to God and have the confidence to know that he hears you? He gives the condition that we must be faithful. We must be righteous. We must be followers of his. And he promises to hear us. Or maybe today you're here and you're not a child of God, but you're sincerely seeking the truth. You're sincerely seeking what must I do to be saved. We would love, love to study with you, to open the word of God, to share God's word together. Or today, because of the life that you're living, because of the choices that you're making, Are your prayers an abomination before God? In other words, we need to examine ourselves, see where we stand with the Lord, and we need to utilize this invitation to examine ourselves, to ask ourselves very simply, If today's my last day on earth, where will I spend eternity? If I die before I leave this room, or if the Lord comes back and we all see him in the twinkling of an eye, where will I spend eternity? If we can help you in any way, to you make your needs known as together we stand, we sing.